Man, how are we doing? A uh, couple things. We got some Boy Scouts here. I'm so grateful for our Cub Scouts here. Thank you guys for holding doors and greeting everybody. We appreciate PAC 728 for uh, loving on us that way. All right, today is Super Bowl Sunday. All right, so if, uh, that's awkward. All right, so, uh, so how many Patriots fans do we have here? Okay, one. All right, and then uh, how many people are kind of anybody but the Patriots? So Eagles, right? All right. How many uh, are just wishing we'd talk about, like, killing off the Demogorgon or something like that? Is anybody else just kind of like, this is just weird? Why do we have to talk about football every freaking week? All right. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, so, yeah, this, um, I feel like it's my duty as, like, a pastor to educate non-football people on football things. So I'm going to educate you a little bit on this. Uh, one of the quarterbacks in today's game, the quarterback's the guy that throws the ball, is going to be Tom Brady. Okay, so just in case you're wondering who that is. Uh, and he is a guy um, that when he was drafted, he was drafted 199th. Like, he's like a guy you forget about. It's like a throwaway draft pick. You're like, eh, whatever. And anyway, when he showed up to, um, to Boston and to whenever he went up to New England and Foxborough, Whenever he went uh, to the stadium, he, he meets up with Robert Kraft, who was the owner. And, and his introduction was this, which I just love this. He's 22 years old, and he goes, Mr. Kraft, I'm the best decision this organization has ever made. He said that at 22 years old. And, you know, it's funny. Like, if you say something really cocky like that and nothing happens, like, you just become a, a dud. Nobody remembers and nobody cares. But turns out he would go on to win five Super Bowls, and he's now he has a chance. And he's been in seven. This is his eighth Super Bowl. I mean, it's crazy. He's five of seven, and uh, and he is actually the best decision that that organization has ever made. Uh, and so, in fact, he's been so successful. He's forty years old. He and I are like the same age. So, like, I, Tom Brady and I are the same age, which is just weird to think about. And. Um, because what, like watching sports growing up, those guys were really old, and all of a sudden you become older, and so thank God now there's somebody my age there still. Anyway. <laughs> and uh, he, there's this docu-series on him, and it's, it's made by a company called Religion of Sports, okay? Uh, do you guys know who Deepak Chopra is? Like uh, Eastern mysticism, like guru meditation guy, all right? Now his son is Gotham Chopra, which is just fun that his name's Gotham. Anyway, Gotham uh, made up uh, the religion of sports, kind of like just kind of as he looked at it, sports was like a religion. He's looking at all the traditions. There's a spiritual experience that fans have, that there's something about believing in your team, that there's just something really powerful about that. And so he wanted to investigate it. And so he got with Tom Brady and some other guys, and they've kind of created this new religion, which is sort of fun, I guess. And, uh, and one of the things is just this ability for you to control yourself. And Tom Brady, in this docuseries of religious sports, um, he goes in to talk about his preparation and how hard he works at uh, controlling his diet, at controlling his uh, attitude, his work ethic, the time he puts in. It's just really intense. And this is one of the things he said in this docuseries. He goes, what are you willing to do and what are you willing to give up to be the best you can be? And if, you are want, if you're going to want to compete against me, you better be willing to give up your life because I'm giving up mine. That's Tom at age 40, all right? So the amount of cockiness hasn't changed. <laughs> it's just now, now it's where, like, it ain't bragging if it's true, right? I mean, like, uh, I mean, he's a winner. And I think there's some of us here, we would look at that and we're like, I want to win like that. I want to be that successful. I want to have that amount of confidence in my ability to perform. And this morning, I want to talk about something better. Better than that amount of confidence. Better than a confidence in your ability to perform here and now. Because ultimately, we know that our ability to perform is deeply dependent on our ability to, well, live. And have healthy bodies. And things that don't break. And uh, that's where we're going this morning. So, we're going to be in Matthew's Passion. In fact, if you don't have a Bible this morning, we're in Matthew 26. If you don't have a Bible, would you raise your hand? Wave it like you care, or wave it, wave it in the air like you care, and a Bible is going to come to you. If you don't have a Bible at all, there's our gift to you. If you forgot yours today, just use it and then leave it on the chair when you're done. We want everyone to have a copy of God's Word. And we're in Matthew's Passion. Um, you know, the passion is used a lot in our secular society as a word to describe, like, deeply loving, like, you know, there's passion novels, like, 
you know, with Fabio on the cover. And, uh, and so I think like the world has stolen what this word means. And the original word of passion literally meant the suffering of Jesus going to the cross and on the cross. That's what passion means. And so we're looking at Matthew's passion, which is Matthew writing about from Matthew 26 to Matthew 28, Jesus's journey to the cross, all right? And so we're gonna find out where Jesus' confidence lies and we're gonna contrast it with Peter, who we love Peter because so much of us are like Peter. And we're gonna start out with, um, last week we talked about uh, Jesus doing the Last Supper and he talked about his body being bread and, and his blood being the wine as they're symbolic of what he was about to do in going to the cross. And so they've just finished up that, that meal where he introduced the Lord's Supper. And that's where we're picking up the story here in Matthew 26, starting in verse 31. We're on page 832 in the Bible we passed out. Here we go, Matthew 26. So they just done the Lord's Supper, and when they had sung a hymn. Now it's interesting uh, that, that they sung a hymn. I, I love the fact that they kind of reveal this information. Well, actually all um, you know, Passover meals were, were this is a traditional uh, meal and a traditional thing. You'd sing a hymn, and it was usually from Psalm 115, and you end with Psalm 118. And just so you just think about this, as they're singing, the words that they're singing are something to the effect of, this, you know, they, they sing like, God is great, and then his love endures forever. And then let everyone in Israel say, God is great, and his love. And then like there's responsive reading that goes involved with that. And then there's one of this part that goes, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And it's prophetic in a sense because Jesus is uh, the stone that the builders rejected, and that's become the cornerstone. So the, the stone that the builders, those who were kind of doing Israel, those who were in charge of Israel, they reject Jesus. He then becomes the cornerstone of faith, which is kind of neat. And that's what they sang. And then when they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that was a common place where uh, they went. It wasn't too far uh, from Jerusalem. And then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night which is sort of a downer, but then he's gonna say, but it's, but it's written, this has been prophesied. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So there's a happy ending to the story. And then here's the, here's the hard part about this is essentially he's quoting though from scripture to which you're like, what is he quoting? Now this is what's really cool. Um, Matthew, and it's cool one because Jesus said it, but Matthew highlights this fact that he says it. And he's going back to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, where it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. And what it's saying is that the man that stands next to him, here's what's interesting about that, that's saying a neighbor, that's saying someone who is of equal value, of equal in rank, someone who is a neighbor, someone who's next to him, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So this is prophetic, and it kind of alludes to that there's a God man that's going to be struck. And the reason we know this is even more important, and this is the part that if, you know, the disciples listening could have been like, please, let's go back to Zechariah and share with us what that means. Well, verse 1 of Zechariah 13 is, On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and from uncleanness. So the biggest thing that whenever Matthew's writing this, the Jews in general never thought the Messiah would be a suffering Messiah, that he would die. Kind of the whole story about Jesus is that, or the Messiah, he would come in, he'd take over, he'd make things right, he was a political, he'd be definitely a, uh, a military ruler who would, you know, kick out bad guys and, you know, a reign would start. But here it is that clearly that God is doing this striking the shepherd, and this is the shepherd that's going to forgive sin, cleanse the people from sin. Think about that for a second. That's what Zechariah is pointing to. Old Testament, God's love shining through that God would do something to the shepherd to cleanse the people from sin. So that sort of sets up uh, this passage, which is going to be really intense, okay? So, so Zechariah is sort of pointing towards what Matthew is, is writing here and what and Old Testament. Because uh, Zechariah is written hundreds of years before Jesus even shows up on the scene. So verse 33, look at this. So after Jesus says that, Peter goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And he looks at the disciples, kind of does one of these, steps back, and goes, though they all will fall away because of you, 
I will never fall away. (laughs) And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then Peter's like, no, 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 no. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And the thing that's interesting about Peter, there's a lot of eyes creeping up in here. Because why is that? Peter had confidence in himself. And not only did he have confidence in himself, it's it's, this kind of thing like, I am better than everybody else here. In fact, it's not, an. I I love this. Have you guys seen this yearbook quote? This always cracks me up. It's not enough that I should succeed, others should fail. I mean, it's kind of like that's where Peter's going. (laughs) All these other disciples, they're a little flaky. They're going to fail you, but I'm going to be on top as usual because I'm Peter. And this is what I really appreciate about Peter. Peter's like one of my favorite guys just because in general, um, he reminds me of me. Because there's a part of me that gets that sort of competitive, and you know, especially growing up, I don't know if any like in grade school, not only did you want to do well, you want everyone else to do miserable. Or am I like the only one that's sort of like that dark? Okay, yeah, all right, so yeah. Maybe you had siblings. If you had siblings and you wanted them to fail, so you could be doing, okay, that's kind of how it goes, right? So that's sort of that confidence himself. And he had a lot to be confident in. Look, Jesus himself said to him, you know, you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. Okay, that's, that's a pretty big deal for him to say. Think about that. And not only that, but Peter is, um, he's the kind of guy uh, that, that he healed people. He healed the sick. He, um, he raised the debt. Okay, he walked on water for crying out loud. Here's a guy who's had a lot of confidence and he did what Jesus told him to do and then he did it and he was successful. You know what's really hard about people that just follow the system and then they're really successful? They point out to everybody else and like, hey, my kid sleeps, so should yours. (laughs) For those of you with children, you would understand. When you have a hard child, they don't want to sleep. It just makes you go crazy. All right, anyway. So anyway. So here's this reality. We can be so confident in ourselves. We can be so confident that we can kind of put other people off. And then, and then we start to start to bask in our last glories. But the reality is nobody cares what you la- When you look at your performance, nobody cares about the last thing you did. In fact, Tom Brady knows this. I love this quote by Tom. Nobody gives a blankety blank about what I've done. Which I'm like, no, I think a lot of Patriots fans are pretty excited about all the things you've done. But they want me to do it now. Thank God there is another Sunday. Now, I want you to think about that. Here's a guy who controls everything he puts in his body. He controls his attitude, his mental, like, approach to the game. He controls, he's a guy that says football is unconditional love. I mean, like, this this guy is totally in. His kids know uh, that he's all about football. His wife, Giselle, understands that he's laid everything aside. He's given his life to football, and they're going to bask in the glory of it. And maybe when he retires one day, that'll be, there'll be another day for them to, you know, spend time with him. But for right now, he is focused on football. And, and this is really great, and there's a lot of sacrifice, and if life is all about the championship, that's exactly, he's doing it exactly right. Because he's taking all the things he can control, all the things he can do, and he's doing the best he possibly can, and he has the right attitude about his past. Nobody cares about it. They want a winner now. In fact, if you were to go, you know, before the season started, they're like, Tom Brady at 40, he's going to fall apart. He's not going to be the same guy. And, like, that just drove him to do, to, to do even better, to work even harder, to prove those people they don't know what they're talking about. But isn't that exhausting? I mean, that's exhausting. When you have to put that much effort and that much work and that much just like unbelievable amount of time into perfecting you. And here's the thing. Nobody's going to care about Tom Brady in 50 years. I mean, there'll be this memory. He'll be in the Hall of Fame. And people are like, ah, Tom Brady, what a wonderful. And then like some old geezer will walk in there. Like, I remember Super Bowl 52. Man, it was a humdinger. Super Bowl 51, they came back from 25. I mean, and that's the only, buddy, only guy that's going to remember. He'll die off, and nobody will remember that anymore. And then all of a sudden, it's just a guy in a history book. Okay? That's it. That's the best you've got, and your whole life was about that. And that's why the question then for Tom, what happens when there isn't another Sunday? Now what? Because you can't control your own life. I mean, we can do a lot to make ourselves live longer, 
Uh, we can eat kale every meal. I mean, you know, like, and some of you do it, and I'm really, man, God bless you. Um, but did you know that every day is written in the book of life before you were born? So, like, if you eat kale or cheeseburgers, it doesn't matter. But anyway, that's another story. All right, keep, keep moving. Anyway, your body is a temple of God, so take care of it. Okay. But there's nothing you can do to control the outcome of your life. There's nothing you can do to control it. You can't because someone outside of you has set the parameters and boundaries of life. And that is the problem when we start to look at our ability to control things. Control your marriage. Control your spouse. Control your kids. Control your job. If I just do, then this is going to happen. What happens when it doesn't? And this is sort of like the... um, American evangelical Christianity has sometimes gone to this. It's about what you can do and about how you perform. And if you could just simply work a little bit harder, you might be able to fill in the blank. It's all up to you and what you can do. And I think there's this part of us where we have the, like, the spiritual side of Christianity and we like sing songs and we cry about emotional things. And then there's just real life. There's practical, like someone's got to pay the bills, someone's got to show up to work, got to work hard. And we kind of keep those two things separate. But what I think what we're going to see here is that when you do that, you start to end up focusing on yourself and your world gets real small. Watch this. Watch what, watch, watch how, you're going to see that's Peter. And then we're going to contrast Peter to Jesus when he comes up to something he can't control. Watch this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter, the guy that just said, I will never deny you. And the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. That's like his, his, his inner three guys. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And that word troubled means struck with terror, like freaked out. I mean, he is, there's like horror coming over him. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me, pray with me, stay with me, stay awake with me. Don't let me be alone. There's this desperation in Jesus wanting companionship as he's experiencing being freaked out. Now, what would cause him to be sad, that sad and scared to death? Now, think about this. This is the guy who could turn a happy meal into a feast. This is the guy that walks on water when other people fall in. He pulls them out walking on water. This is the guy that raises the dead. This is the guy that can do it all. What would scare him that much? I want you to think about that. Here's Jesus literally scared to death. In fact, in Luke's gospel, he is experiencing shock, and we know that because he's sweating and bleeding. His, his sweat, there's blood and sweat and tears, and that happens, we know that, from medicine world, be, from being in a state of shock. Now, what would cause Jesus to be shocked like that? And here's what I think it is, and, we'll, and I'll show you why in a second. He is getting a glimpse of what's about to happen to him. You know, for eternity past, he... Um, he and God had this plan to save humanity. And it, it, it you know, was part of him was going to the cross to die. Um, and then all of a sudden when he gets to that point, oh no, he gets to realize the fullness of the wrath he's about to take in. Now I want you to think, I want you to just kind of listen to this for a second. Because, because it, you may not be able to kind of just really feel the gravity of the weight of this. Um, I was freaked out as a kid about roller coasters. I don't know if anybody else was. Um, I did end up jumping out of airplanes for a living for a while, but uh, <laughs> but there's two things I was afraid of as a kid. One was roller coasters, and the other one was being afraid of stuff. I hated the fact that I was afraid, and so every, periodically I would go on roller coasters just to see if I could get over it, and it was just like I'd be white-knuckling the thing the whole time because I thought for sure I was going to die, and it was all over, and it was just the most painful experience ever. So going up the roller coaster with the click, Click, click. That was like torture for me. All right? I'm like, no! Nah! That's the part where I was screaming, okay? And everyone's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, ah! 
And because it was so torturous to kind of like, I, was, I knew what I was about to experience. It was just like this prolonged agony of what I was about to go do. And this is where Jesus is. It's the prolonged agony of like, oh my gosh, I'm about to take on the wrath of God. I'm about to take on the punishment of sin for all time, for all people. I mean, that's freaky. And so that's where he is. And now check this out. Going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, whenever I read that, I was always like, what, what do you mean cup? I mean, is that, what's that? Is that a euphemism for something? And it is, but it comes from Scripture. And it's a euphemism or another word for the wrath of God. And we know that from Jeremiah 25. Thus says the Lord said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. And make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall be drink and staggered and be crazed because of the sword that I'm sending them. Now listen, listen. So here's Jesus about to take the wrath where he will be crazed, where he will experience separation from God. I want you to hear this. Jesus is going to experience separation from God the Father. Now he's planned it. It's been a part of the plan and he knows that he must drink it because that is how he allows human beings who are sinners to experience grace is that someone's got to drink the wrath for them. You with me? Someone's got to do it for them. And so Jesus in this moment, he's going to the Father and he's saying, Father, if it be possible, I'm, I'm trusting you. If there's another way, oh, let's do another way. But Jesus had full confidence in the Father. Now, I want you to see this. Remember, he, he's coming weak. He's coming weak. Peter, when he kind of faced with adversity, faced with something hard, he comes, you know, shows strength. And Jesus does the opposite. He shows weakness and, and fear and trepidation. He goes, Father, let this cup pass from me because his confidence was in the Father. And I think this is huge. He's saying, listen, if God, if there's another way, if I can get out of this somehow, I'm in. I'll, I'll take that out of the way. If there's another way to save mankind where I don't have to experience the wrath of God, let's do it that way. And he's going to the Father. And here's what I love about this is you don't hear the Father say no, but that's what happens. The Father says no. And I kind of, I was trying to think of how I could just really explain that. Um, my son, Jet, ha had the flu this week. Anybody else going through, like, flu issues this week? And you're just like, Tamiflu, you're my best friend? Okay. Well, um, Jet got the flu, and he was sick. And uh, <sighs> there's a point where you got to give him the medicine. There's two kinds of medicine. There's the yummy medicine, which is ibuprofen, children's Tylenol. It's, like, glorious. Kids will chug it if you, get, you know, just leave it out. They'll be like, nah. It's called CDC on that one. They can't die from it. All right, anyway. <coughs> uh, that has happened. Okay, and then, so there's the yucky medicine, which is like the bad stuff. And so uh, Adrian's like, can you take the medicine? You know, you need to take this medicine. It'll make you feel better. And so he opens wide, and, the, and it looks like he's really doing really well here. And then a minute later, or actually like five seconds later, he goes, and he spits it all out because it's the yucky kind. And then I, I like, give me the syringe. And so I, I go, Jet, do you trust me? No, no, I don't trust you. No, no, Jet, do you trust me? <laughs> no, Daddy, I don't want the medicine. I don't want, I don't want yucky medicine. And I said, listen, Daddy needs to do this, and I love you, and you've got to trust your Daddy. Okay, Daddy, we're going to do three squirts, and you swallow, and then we can get something that won't taste so awful, like a sucker. And he's like, okay, Daddy. So we do squirt. And I said, and you swallow. He's like, Ugh. Let's do squirt two, squirt two, <laughs> squirt three. <clears throat> and then he cries. And then I hold him. You see, as a father, I mean, this is, this is the beautiful thing about God. It, it's this incredible relationship with Jesus of like, this is what we need to do. Do you trust me? And I love this that Jesus himself got, gets to this point because I think there's a lot of us here who get to that point where God is putting us in places where we're not feeling comfortable and it's hard and God's going, do you trust me? 
Do you trust your father in heaven? I'm your daddy. This medicine is going to be yucky. But ultimately, it's the best thing in the world for you. Now watch, watch what happens. So Jesus prays this, is there any other way? And then he's just kind of just sweating drops of blood and he's just a mess. And he, came, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he goes to Peter. He doesn't do this to the other disciples. He goes to Peter. Hey, Pete. So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch him pray. You may not enter into the temptation. And then he says this line, which is so true. The spirit is willing, but in the flesh is weak. That's the human condition. Because I don't care how in control of yourself you are, there's going to be a point where you can't control it. And you're going to want to control it, and you're going to want to do the right thing, and you're going to want to have a great attitude, mental attitude, and have all the discipline. And one day your body's going to break down, or one day your will's going to break down, and because of the weakness of the flesh, and everybody's going to find that place. And it might be death where that happens to you. That's the human condition. And Peter, that's why we love Peter, He's falling apart right in front of Jesus. I will never deny you. I'll do whatever. I, I'll die for you. But I can't stay awake for an hour with you because that's just too much. And then Jesus, desperate for companionship in his darkest hour, goes back to the Father. He starts praying again. For a second time, he went away and prayed, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Listen, Jesus sought a way to save God's people without being crucified and absorbing the wrath of God. And this becomes really, 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 really important. When I was in college... Um, do you guys remember college, or is it like a big blur? Kind of a blur? No, there, there's there's parts, parts of college that stick out to me. Like the rest of it's like super fast, a lot of uniforms, a lot of yelling, a lot of marching, and a lot of studying. But there's one moment that, like, it just fast forward to one point, or rewind to one point, and it's like me sitting in my um, barracks room and uh, looking over at Hayward Davis, who was my roommate, and I don't know why the conversation went this way, but it did. He was always reading his Bible, and I was always studying. And I'm like, why are you wasting your time? There's work to do. You're going to fail out. You need to study. And he would be always in God's Word. And I would say to him, listen, <clears throat> there's many ways to heaven, but Jesus is my way. And my thinking was like, oh, well, he's a Christian. He'd be like totally on board with him because I'm like essentially saying I'm on your team. I'm a Jesus fan. I'm an all up for Jesus. And he goes, don't ever say that. That is just dumb. And I was like, whoa, what got into your pants? You know, I'm like, what happened there? And over time, I started to realize that what he was saying, or why he got so offended by that statement, is the reason why, um, if you're not a Christian here, you get offended when Christians say that Jesus is the only way. And here's why. It's this. It's this right here. Jesus in the garden going, if there's any other way that we can save humanity... Let's do it that way. And there's no other way. Jesus has to die. He has to take on God's wrath. And he's the only one who can do it because he's the only one perfect. He's a perfect sacrifice. He's the only one that could stand before a man saying, I have not sinned, but in their, in their place I will die. And I will take separation, for God so they, separation from God so they don't have to. Now think about that. So what that means is, you can't have like five pillars and you just do, you're really generous, you're really modest, you're really sweet, you're really kind because good deeds in and of themselves always leave you short because there's darkness in your heart because you're a natural born sinner. There's not one person that can say, you know, I just don't really experience sin. That's just not me. Now, I know you people are weak and <laughs> you have your crutch, Jesus, and so... No, no, but that's it. Do you see that? The reality is we're, every one of us are sinners and all of us fall short of the glory of God. And that's exactly the point. Nobody is good enough. And so Jesus dies. And that's why it's offensive to say there are other ways to heaven. Because if there's other ways to heaven, then we're fools. Because Jesus didn't have to die. 
Jesus, you're a moron. Why would you go and take on the wrath of God if there's another way? There is no other way. In fact, if there's another way, we are to be pitied. Like, you should feel sorry for me that I've given my whole entire life and I should have gone like corporate America or politics or something else and done something reliable and faithful with my life if there's another way. You guys are all fools for giving up your Sunday morning because we're not that entertaining. The music's not that good. The preaching's not that amazing, right? You can go anywhere else in Austin and get better entertainment than this. But the reason why you come is because Jesus died on the cross for sinners and for sin. And that's why we show up every Sunday. And that's why we sing songs in G, C, and D that are really easy to sing because we want enough people to kind of join in the crowd. That's why. That's why. So you've got to understand that if you're not a Christian, the, the reason why that sounds so offensive because it's so offensive to say that there's another way because then Jesus died, took on the wrath of God for nothing. And here, here's the other thing. Well, maybe he just thought he did or he made it up. Listen, if you're making it up, you don't make your, your hero of the story look like such a weakling. Like what culture values that? You know, oh, I, my culture really values weakness and like just uh, getting crushed and defeated all the time. Like those cultures don't last. Okay, they just don't. But Jesus, if, the reason why it's in there is because that's what he actually prayed. Because you, like he's saying, like, listen, I'm weak. I don't want to do this. If there's another way, let's do it that way. And that's why it happened that way. And then ultimately he, he goes to the cross. Thank God he goes to the cross. Because he has the courage or willingness to submit to the Father even though that medicine would be yucky. In this last couple of verses, then he came back to the disciples and said to them, and you can kind of just hear the sarcasm, sleep and take your rest later on. See the hours at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. And I love this. Hey, you guys that couldn't even stay awake with me, I'm about to go die for you. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. And in walks Judas with a little band of temple guards and people ready to take Jesus away. You see, Jesus accepted the cross being confident in the Father. Now, this is what I want, Hebrews 12, 3 says that for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame, which means this, that God the Father set God's people in front of him and then put a cross in between them. It says, you get them when you endure this cross. And then he goes to the cross and he takes on the wrath. And listen, remember, he's not, a, he's not like most heroes who die bravely and valiantly. It's not like Braveheart, freedom, right? He got on the cross. He's like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Looking like a complete wimp. But he's taking on the wrath of God, experiencing separation from God, experiencing the horror that you and I will never have to face because he died for us. Oh, isn't that beautiful? But your confidence has to be in him and not in you. Did you see that? Your confidence is what Jesus has done for you, not on what you can do. Because although you're really smart, although you're really intellectually strong, although you're physically able and have unbelievable amounts of talent, all that stuff is going to deteriorate and decay to ultimately to your dust. But your soul lives on forever. And so therefore, your hope and your confidence has to be in something eternal. And that's God, our Father. And that's where Jesus' confidence was. And hence, that's where our confidence should be. Now this morning, I just want to ask you that question. Where is your confidence? If your confidence is in you, in your ability, in your ability to handle yourself, whether it's in a boardroom whether it's school, if you just study hard enough, if you just prepare uh, the slides, if you get your slide deck right, if you, you know, your marriage, if you just do all the right things, you read all the books, if you read the self-help books, if you kind of find the inner you that's the best you now, then all of a sudden you're going to find that there's power in you, but ultimately you will run out of runway. There won't be another Sunday. There's, your life will end. You are terminal. Everyone here is terminal. And the only weird thing is you just don't know when it's going to end. And so my heart for you, this is why, this is why, um, 
this gets emotional a little bit because it's, there's people here that have heard this over and over and over again. And it drives me crazy sometimes because I'm like, no, 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 no. Jesus died for you. Like, yeah, I got it. I just need to handle myself. and I'm, I don't need that. No, no, no. Jesus died for you. Even in your strength, you're not enough. Even in uh, your abilities to handle yourself, it's all gonna wreck itself because inside there's broken things that have driven you to succeed. And my hope and my heart that that drivenness that has pushed you to succeed where you're at, that you would see that that brokenness inside your soul is always a wedge between you and God and he wants you to come to him. He's saying, please come to me. All who are weary and heavy burden and I will give rest Rest for your soul. And I want people here to have rest in their soul. I don't want you to go out there trying to perform it out. I was 22, thought I had it all together. And then all of a sudden I realized just going to ranger school that I couldn't do it, that there was things beyond my control and I needed help. God help me. And then all of a sudden I realized it wasn't about me. He changed me from the inside out to realize it's all about him and how amazing he is. And nothing on this earth will satisfy my soul like a relationship with the God of the universe. Don't settle for Super Bowls when you can have all of heaven. Where is your confidence? Is it in you and how you're going to perform today that's going to be forgotten about in 20 years? Or is it in Jesus who is eternal? And anything not eternal is eternally out of date. That's my hope in my heart. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, please, would you put your faith in Jesus this morning? Just simply believe that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. And if you're a Christian here, would you walk like that's true? Would your life be marked by this confidence of trusting Jesus in everything that you do? It'll transform you, it'll transform your family. You'll take the ache and the burden off your soul. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so grateful. (sighs) Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for allowing me to believe. I just, I've been so hardened in wanting to perform and wanting to be seen as perfect, wanting to be seen as my Facebook profile as opposed to who I really am. And God, I'm praying that we would be authentic people, understanding our own brokenness and our performance will never save us. God, I'm praying that, your, that we would see that only your performance will save us. That what you did for us on that cross, you who knew no sin, you became sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God. And God, I'm so grateful for that. So God, would you please work on hearts for people who may not be ready to believe yet? Would you pierce hearts? Would they come to saving faith and see your amazing grace? And God, I'm praying that for those of us who are Christians would walk this thing out. We would show it in our lives at school, work, at play, with family, with parents and children, with spouses. We would have this confidence in you and not in our ability to control.